Hello, yes, uh, I'm Camilla and today I'm going to be sharing some really quite preliminary results from a new project that started um, just in January, um, where we're exploring sexual identity and welfare inequalities in the United Kingdom. This project's uh, led by Peter Matthews at the University of Stirling and is funded by the Nuffield Foundation. So just to give a little bit of context about the UK welfare system. So historically, this was designed around the heterosexual nuclear family and that's who it was really designed to support. Um, and sort of recent welfare reform and retre retrenchment over the last decade has led to a greater expectation that people will rely on their own kind of wealth and personal assets um, to provide their own individual welfare. And that would include um, things like housing wealth. And so we know the welfare system has been critiqued in the past for sexist, racist and ableist assumptions. Um, but to our knowledge, ours is the first project which explores specifically uh, welfare inequality related to sexual identity. So the wider project has both uh, quantitative data analysis and uh, a qualitative interviewing element. And as part of the wider project, we'll be exploring LGBT plus um, inequality experiences. But within the secondary data analysis, we're just exploring um, LGB identity based on the direct survey questions. And that's just because the surveys that we're using um, don't typically have information on trans identities. So, when we think about wealth and assets, there's a few reasons why we think that LGB people might be likely to have different experiences than their heterosexual counterparts. So one example would be historic barriers on unmarried women and gay men and bisexual men accessing mortgages. So until around the 1980s, um, single women would have needed a male kind of co-signature or guarantor to access a line of credit. And, um, kind of stigma surrounding HIV and AIDS meant that gay and bisexual men face discrimination when accessing um, insurance and, and therefore may not have been able to access life insurance, which could have prevented them from accessing mortgages. We also know that because of marriage and civil partnership rights denial, um, long-term LGB partners would not have benefited in the same way as heterosexual married couples from inheriting private pension provision from their partners. And we know that LGB groups often have non-traditional life course trajectories and they might be more likely to experience dislocation um, when they come out. And this means that they might lack kind of traditional welfare buffers such as family wealth or inherited housing assets. Um, we also know that historically LGB people were less likely to have children. And this might mean that for women in particular, they might have stronger labor market attachments on average, which could lead to higher income. Um, some other factors we think might be related to um, LGBT welfare inequalities is that we know that LGB people on average have lower levels of well-being and therefore they might be more impacted by changes to disability benefits. Um, we also know that traditionally the UK welfare system has disadvantaged single people, particularly single men. Um, and we know that LGB people are more likely to be single, so may have been more negatively impacted. On average, we know that LGB people are younger. Um, so this disadvantage might have been compounded by reductions in housing benefit. Uh, and uh, for single under 35s and the bedroom tax and the phase out of uh, universal credit impacting younger people uh, first. We also uh, know that LGB people are more likely to live in London and the southeast and urban areas uh, so could have been disproportionately impacted by policies like the benefits cap and the literature suggests that LGB people are more likely to live in private rented accommodation. So the data here is the special license version of Understanding Society, which we're using in order to access the sexual identity variable. 
Um, sexual identity is asked in waves three, five, seven, nine, and 11. Um, and we're using waves three through 11. So we're keeping the most recent record per person in this analysis, and we're using the most recent LGB um, reported status. So if a person um, dropped out, for example, after wave seven, it would be their wave seven records that's included. Um, and if a person changed their response to the sexual identity question um, across the waves, then we're keeping or we're using the, the most recent response. Um, in the next slides, we're showing weighted outcomes, but on this slide, you can see the weighted and unweighted outcomes. So we, in the unweighted, we have around 92%, uh, sorry, 93% identifying as heterosexual, just over 1% identifying as gay or lesbian, or 1% um, identifying as bisexual, around 1% um, identifying as an other or other sexuality, and just over 3% um, identifying as prefer not to say, so not giving um, an answer to this question. Uh, we then create a, a dummy variable for being LGB or not being LGB. Um, in this case, the people who identify as other or prefer not to say were dropped um, treated as missing. And here in the weighted um, response, in the weighted results, you can see that 97% um, percent are in the not LGB category, so heterosexual, and about 3% are in the LGB category. Um, our sort of outcome variables here, we have a number of things that we're interested in. Um, the first one is whether or not the individual is receiving state benefits um, of more than £50 per week. And you can see about 40% of the sample um, are in this category. We also have whether or not they receive uh, income from their investments of £500 plus per year. You can see about 7% are in this category. We also have a uh, property value, which is shown here as a five point scale from uh, not owning a property to owning a property of over £350,000 um, in value. We also have whether they're renting through a local authority or a homeowners association, um, which is around 18% of the sample. Um, and then we have whether or not they own their own home or whether they're renting, um, which would include local authority, homeowners association, and also private renting. And you can see that the majority of the sample are uh, homeowners. That includes people who have a mortgage, um, so will go on to own their home. And then other control variables, um, and other variables we're looking at are personal labour income, household income, sex, age, having a partner, having children, having a degree, having a long-term illness or disability, living in an urban area and living in the southeast or London. So the graph here shows each of our kind of outcome variables and LGB status. Um, so you can see on average, LGB people have lower housing values, um, which is the green bar. They're less likely to be homeowners, the orange bar. Um, they're more likely to live in uh, LA or HA rented accommodation. They are less likely to have investment income of over £500 a year. And they're also less likely to be receiving benefits income of £50 plus per week, which is interesting because we see that they're disadvantaged in these other categories. So we might have expected them to be more likely to be receiving benefits, which isn't the case. When we look at income, we can see that um, bisexual people seem to be particularly disadvantaged in personal labour income um, compared to both gay and lesbian people and also heterosexual people. But we see that um, gay and lesbian people are slightly more advantaged than heterosexual people in terms of their average labour income. So this might explain why they're less likely to be receiving benefits. We also broke this down by gender um, because we thought that might make Quite a difference. So um, we have graphs here both for women who are in and not in the LGB category and men who are in and not in the LGB category. Um, mostly the patterns are similar. Uh, so for women we see less likely to uh, own a home, have lower housing values, 
um, less likely to have investment income. Uh, for LA and HA rented accommodation, there isn't much of a difference between um, not LGB and LGB women, um, but there is quite a big difference uh, in terms of receiving benefits of £50 plus per week, with non-LGB women more likely to receive this. Um, for men, we see similar patterns with LGB men having lower housing values on average, being less likely to be homeowners, uh, more likely to live in LA or HA rented accommodation. For men, investment income is quite similar between LGB and non-LGB men. Um, and for benefits, again, we see that heterosexual men are on average um, more likely to be receiving benefits. We do the same by region, so we thought that living in the southeast of London um, might make a difference to these impacts and we know that uh, LGB people are more likely to um, live in, in that area. We don't see again um, huge differences between living within and outside of London in the southeast. The patterns are quite similar, um, although for those who live in the southeast in London, um, LGB people seem to have uh, lower housing values, even and the difference is bigger uh, for those who live in the southeast in London than those who live outside of that area. Um, but also within London, um, investment income is kind of more similar between non-LGB and LGB people than it is outside of London, where LGB people are less likely to be receiving investment income. When we look at um, average personal labour income, we see that for all groups living inside London, um, they have higher personal income than those who live outside of London. Um, we see that bisexual people, uh, both inside and outside of London, are um, the most kind of disadvantaged or have the lowest average incomes. We also know that the being um, lesbian, gay and bisexual is probably related to our other controls. So that's um, what we're looking at here. So um, here we have, we show that LGB people are more likely to live in the southeast of London, which is the green bar. They're slightly more likely to live in urban areas, less likely to have a partner, less likely to have children, uh, slightly more likely to have a disability and slightly more likely to have a degree. The other graph here shows bivariate associations between age and each of our outcome variables. Um, so we see that age has an association with um, being LGB, which we expected from um, the literature, but it also has quite strong associations um, with our other outcome variables. So for example, in particular, receiving benefits of 50 pounds plus per week, which is um, most likely related to pension, state pensions. So this is why it's important to use regression modelling to kind of control um, for this and to look at the net effect of being LGB, which is what I'm going to move to doing now. So um, models one and two here are the outcome is uh, receiving investment income of £500 plus a year and models three and four are about um, being a homeowner. So in each of these we can see in the model, the first model, which just includes LGB status, we see a significant negative effect of being in the LGB group. However, when we add the other controls, um, this effect drops out. We also additionally tried the, the control model and fitted um, an additional interaction effect between being LGB and each of the other controls. So um, each model had one additional interaction effect um, with each of our controls and being LGB. Um, we didn't find any significant interactions for investment income, but for home ownership, there was significant interactions between being LGB and having children and having a partner. And the margins plots are shown for that. So you can see that the um, sort of there's a bigger difference in outcomes uh, for LGB people who do and do not have children. Um, there, there's not such a difference for uh, non-LGB people. Um, so for LGB people have, uh, not having children, 
is related to having um to sorry for LGB people not having children is uh, related to being more likely to uh, be a homeowner um, and not having children is less uh, you're less likely to be a homeowner and this is a kind of a bigger difference than for um, not LGB people and then the opposite is true of having a partner so having a partner has a sort of smaller effect for LGB people and a bigger effect for heterosexual um, people with uh, having a partner, meaning that you're uh, more likely to own a home. We then look at uh, housing value. Um, so here you can see that uh, being in the LGB category, it has a significant negative effect on housing value. And this effect stays consistent when we add in controls, when we also add in um, a uh, interaction effect between LGB and being female, and also when we add in um, geographical area, so living in urban areas and living in London or the southeast. Um, so, and we also see further interaction, uh, significant interactions between having children and um, having a partner and being LGB. Again, the effects are similar that having children um, results in a, a bigger difference for LGB people whereas having a partner has a sort of smaller impact for LGB people. Uh, finally, we look at receiving state benefits of £50 plus per week. This is quite an interesting one. So where we um, just include LGB status, we see a negative effect um, of being LGB and receiving uh, benefits. When we add the controls, this effect drops out and it becomes non-significant. However, when we add in an interaction effect between being LGB and female, um, we then find a significant positive effect of being um, in the LGB group, which uh, stays constant when we add in controls for living in an urban area and living in London in the southeast. Again, we find further interactions, uh, this time for age and again for having children with the effect of having children um, being stronger for LGB people. Um, so LGB people who have children are more likely to receive state benefits. And yeah, so in conclusion, we find that asset accumulation does seem to be affected by LGB status. Um, and the design of the welfare system around families with children does seem to have an impact on LGB people. Uh, we also see that demographic controls can make a big difference to the characterization of LGB inequalities. And so figuring out um, which controls to use and, and when to use them will be an important part of the project uh, moving forward. Uh, further work that we're also planning is to refine, refine and evaluate our welfare measures and our analytical methods. And we're also going to do comparable in our analysis because of the small sample size um, on the Family Resources Survey, the Wealth and Assets Survey, and the Scottish Household Survey, just to kind of do a robustness check on our results. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions in the Q&A.